Next example, Florida black bear. So these guys are not our, not our big brown bears, not our grizzly bears, but, but our smaller, their smaller cousins, the black bear. Um, yes, it's true there's black bear in Florida. I know it's hard to maybe imagine that, but it's true. So they preferred to, uh, their ideal habitat are these dense forests, these pine forests that are used to be extensive in especially northern um, Florida. And these, ap these areas had a lot of closed understory veg where they could hide and find forage, etc. These bears are omnivorous, meaning they eat everything, they'll eat whatever they get. So the most recent uh, numbers that I have, they're eating about 80% uh, uh, acorns, right? So they're, they're, they're very, they're, they're mostly veggie folks, right? They eat a lot of berries, roots, palmetto hearts. All that, palmettos are like a small palm tree type thing. Um, and then of course, all the other stuff that they uh, can, can catch when they can catch it. Um, they're sexually dimorphic. So the males are bigger than the females. Um, right now, they are Florida's largest terrestrial mammal. Um, some, of the, some of the manatees and stuff can get bigger, but if we just talk about terrestrial stuff, they're, they're the biggest stuff on the, on the land. Uh, like our mountain lions we're just mentioning, these guys are asocial, with the males having a decidedly larger territorial extent on average than the typical female. They have babies uh, born at the start of the year. And it's very similar to our mountain lions in that they, the, the babies will stay with the mom for um, an extended period of time. And uh, initially nursing and then eventually learning how to, to forage by, by watching mom. On the order of you know one to two decades in terms of a lifespan, so relatively long lived critters. They've been listed as federal, they were first listed as federally threatened in 1974. Best estimates are um, before humans really got going crazy in Florida, uh, modern humans, uh, we would say somewhere on the order of about 12,000 bears in the state, what we now call the state of Florida. And the most recent census that, that I know of was about 1,000 to 1,500 bears. So a small fraction of the total amount. Again, you guys know this from conservation biology. Rarely do we step in when, there's, when we're starting a problem. We usually seem to step in at the end when it's the most costliest, the, mo the most challenging to recover the, the resource in question. On the lower right, I'm showing you data of roadkill of these animals. So we're starting in 19, so they're declared 1974. So usually it, it takes some kind of formal definition of crisis or problem for us to, to start documenting the, the, the real condition. And that's what happened here. So then starting in 1976, we started keeping track of how many critters were killed each year on Florida roadways. And when you, when you add all these up, this, this data, I haven't updated in, in the last several years, but, but to up until about a decade ago, um, there were more deaths, or there are about as many deaths as bears are, that are alive right now. So a significant challenge in addition to other things associated with keeping this species going um, are these, these challenges associated with roads. So there's a guy that was unfortunately killed. Um, again, a typical way we build roads in Florida. Also, I should say Florida um, doesn't have an income tax, state income tax. So funding roads and other more routine public works and things can often be a challenge. So we have a very high proportion of toll roads in the state of Florida, much more so than in a quote unquote average other state. And so what that also means is when we put roads in, we generally try to do them the cheapest possible. So here's an example of an older roadway. It was basically mow down the forest, pour, pour stuff, go, we're done, right? So no fencing, no wildlife barriers, nothing like that. And that, in, in this case, allows uh, mortality of these critters, unfortunately. Okay, so about a decade ago, here's what we had for us going in terms of black bears in Florida. So here's the state of Florida. The pink is the remnant primary range 
And then the blue is areas where they sometimes are. So this is the, the remnant habitat of Florida's black bears. And what I'm going to do next is going to, and so there's a guy crossing the road. So I'm going to circle in on this area here, which is up near Daytona Beach and, and that part of uh, Florida, where we have um, over that, that period where the study was done in terms of looking at roadkill mortality, where um, more than half of the deaths from roads were happening in this one area. So there's something interesting in this area. Let's, let's look a little closer at that and see if we can tell what's going on. So here we go. So this is, again, this is by Daytona Beach. And just to orient you, here's the ocean. This, this black thing over here is the ocean. Um, this light uh, stippled gray is the forest. And then obviously you can see roads are on here. Now we have two different types of symbolizations here. So this, and this is for a period from 93 to 95. This is just one, one, one representative period so we can look at some patterns. So the red triangles are where a bear died. The pink dot is so-called a bear nuisance, and that means someone reported it. So he didn't necessarily kill the bear, but someone was driving and either had a swerve to avoid the bear, or they saw the bear on the, on the side of the road, you know, something like that, and they're like, oh my gosh, and so enough to trigger a call to 911 or some local authority or something, right? But, but not necessarily killed, okay? So stare at that, and I want you guys to tell me what's going on with the, with the pattern of roadkill. There's more roadkill in the forest area. Okay, that's, that's a hypothesis, good, what else? Uh, right, they're all on roads. So by, by definition, this was, this was ro a study of road associated mortality. So right, so yeah, there could be some bears that died in the forest. That's not on this data set. So this is just, just incidents associated with a roadway. Okay, so Chris, you, you, by center, you're talking about this or where? Yeah, okay so, okay, so yeah, so there seems to be more red triangles here, let's say, than over here. Okay, good. So we, so far we have the hypothesis about the forest explains it. And then Chris is saying, uh, maybe, the, maybe it does or doesn't, but there's, there's, but there's a hot spot over in this section of the map, at least. Other thoughts or other, other uh, impressions? So you're talking about, talking about this one? No, the one on the other side. This one? Yeah, there's a lot of texture on Okay, okay, there, there, there's this one chunk, brrr, but nothing sort of over here or over here. Okay. Maybe they're following the river now from the lake. Okay, good. Maybe there's some other uh, ecological aspect of the landscape that we haven't symbolized. Maybe there's some kind of waterway, rivers. Clearly, riparian corridors are major, major movement corridors for a lot of terrestrial things, like we saw with the mountain lion coming into Palo Alto and all that kind of stuff. Okay, good, possibly. Other thoughts? Yeah, Chris. Hey, the, the roads are larger, uh, the larger the road, the higher the speed and the less talking distance. Ah, okay. So something about the thickness of the of the line of the road, which would imply um, a more major highway, maybe more lanes or more higher speeds or something. Good, 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 good. So if we look, um, so as Jayla said, yeah, we have some, we, we do have some, on this thick line, we do have some kills, right? And there are kills everywhere. If we look hard enough, we can find a kill on, on basically every road, every area. But on average, most of the kills aren't on these thick lines, right? Most of the kills are on these little teeny tiny thin lines. You guys with me? Right? So um, again, and, and all those things you guys suggested are, are absolutely true. Of course, the, yes, they are associated with the forest totally. There probably are some water courses and some, 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 some other features that guide them or, or influence their movements totally. Um, but I think the most important one for this is that size of the road. So just like we saw with our map of our mountain lines in the Santa Monica's a couple minutes ago, they will cross the two lane road, right? When it's an eight lane constant hum and drum of 24 hours a day, 
things going, who the heck knows, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, zig, 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 zig. that's intimidating, right? That's, that is, that is um, the very fact, even if we had no fencing at all, the very fact of that just sound and, 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 and visual, you know, all those signals are going to be like, whoa, 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 that, that's not for me, right? So that's going to tend to discourage attempts at crossing. It's the biggest problem is on these smaller lane areas where we have traffic, maybe not as, as many vehicles, maybe not as fast, but it's more intermittent, right? So you can imagine the bear walking out, looking right, looking left, and go, well, okay, I'll just try across this. And then all of a sudden around the curve comes somebody talking on their cell phone and, you know, boom, right? So good. So I like all the stuff you guys are talking about, but but yes, definitely these these roads that don't have this perpetual barrier or perpetual stream of cars seem to be where the biggest, uh, let me say it a different way. If we wanted to address the problem, if we address that, that's going to give us the biggest bang for the buck in terms of minimizing mortality events. We're talking about bears, and normally we have to talk about bears or mountain lions to get the public's attention and to get to get funding and stuff. But the reality is there's a huge diversity of things killed on our roads. And you guys will see this. You guys will see this. So next, I want to actually before I put this up, let me put that back. So next guess, you guys, you made, you made you guys made a prediction in terms of how many critters are killed. I want you to make a prediction as to what you think. Uh, what organisms do you think will be the the most frequently identified critter for us here in California on our surveys? And then the number two and number three. So I want you to write down the top three critters you think we'll see killed over the next few weeks as we do our surveys. And and make sure that the number one is, is circled or you have it starred or somehow you can go back and look in your notes and, and figure out which that is. So the top three critters killed. By number, by number. Okay, so this is from that, again, that, that, that uh, 93 to 95 period in Florida. This is what they saw. So uh, tons of possums, tons of raccoons, good amount of rabbit, armadillo. We don't have armadillo here. Those of you that are going with me to New Orleans in a couple days, we'll see a lot of armadillo roadkill. Um, uh, and then tortoises, gray squirrels, box turtles, and then we dro start dropping down the single digits. But check it out. Bear are almost as commonly killed as soft-shell turtle, right? Um, now, we got to keep the orders of magnitude here in mind. This is almost, possums are almost two orders of magnitude more. But, but check this out. I mean, this is, this is pretty amazing. Deer and bear killed at uh, the same rate. Um, snake, so, so sometimes, as you guys see when we talk about our surveys, we can't always identify the stuff, either because it's not safe to stop or because they're just so smushed you can't tell. But a lot of times you can tell it's, you know, it's a bird-ish. You can see feathers, but you can't tell what it is. So that's what these are. These are some kind of unidentified snake, some kind of unidentified bird, and then these various snakes. This is racer's a snake. Cattle eager is a big bird. Cooter is a type of turtle, some unknown turtle. Turkey vultures, and then down here into, um, you know, include everything from turkeys and rattlesnakes and stuff, right? So a large diversity of critters killed. This is only from one 13-kilometer stretch of road that people are, 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 were surveying actively to, to document what was going on. So one 13-kilometer stretch of road for, you know, more than a year. So it wasn't, it wasn't just a year, but, but a lot of death going on here. What we can do, which you guys will be able to do once, we, once you have your data, is you can start to do cool stuff like this, right? So we've gone and we've counted. We know how many critters died over, a, say, a certain time period. And uh, in this case, this was this, this state route in Florida, this roadway. And, and because of traffic congestion and other worries, the folks wanted to expand the road. They wanted to, wanted to widen the road. So expanding the road would lead to more vehicles on the road and so the question is what's that going to do how many more critters is that going to kill and in this case people are most worried about the bears so we went and we used that roadkill data from the you know the previous few decades and said okay how many roads how many bears were dying on a road of this size with x x number of vehicle traffic 
per day. And so that's what's displayed here. So this is the number of car, cars or car trips that pass by, go over that road uh, every day, per day. So vehicle trips per day. And then this is the number of bears that were killed uh, on that road segment. And there's of course a lot of noise because it's an ecological system. It's, it's not physics, it's much more complicated. And so, so there's all kinds of noise here. But uh, in general, as we, as we uh, increase the traffic volume, we tend to on average increase the mortality event. And so from this, you can take a regression and what we can figure out is that, hey, so this, so the traffic engineers say, hey, if we do this thing we want to do, this expansion we want to do, we're going to be able to carry 2,500 more uh, bear, or excuse me, uh, uh, car trips per day. So that's good, right? More people get into their houses and this and that, at least supposedly good. Um, and so these guys could say, hey, if we did that, we're going to get one more bear death for every 2,500 additional uh, uh, vehicle trip, vehicle miles. That's very useful. Is that exactly right? No, I guarantee that number's not right, but it's at least an estimate, right? It's, it's, it's getting a ball, ballparking it in terms of what's going on. So we can finally talk about the trade-offs. If we cannot quantify this stuff, even though I know we get into arguments of, of, you know, inherent value and ethics, and those are important arguments to make, but by and large, when, when you're in the trenches and trying to argue with city managers, state planners, those folks, they oftentimes don't have the luxury of talking about the morality of taking different points. We have to give them hard numbers. And this is a fantastic hard number to give them. Okay, you need to do your action. Okay, you can do that. You're going to have this estimated negative downside. So then we can talk about how we mitigate it. In this case, um, this is what they did. So well, this isn't this, <laughs> this is Australia. This is not what they did. But but this uh, serves to make the purpose, which is um, first thing people want to do is put signs up. I really like this picture. You guys know why I like this picture? Can you guys tell what's in this picture? A yeah, it's a dead ostrich or dead emu over there, I should say. Dead emu. So he didn't read the, he didn't read the sign that <laughs> they should be careful. So um, the first thing we do, the cheapest thing we do, the easiest thing everybody should do is put up signs. Watch for wildlife. You know, caution wildlife crossing or, you know, whatever. That costs almost nothing. And it maybe isn't super effective, but at least it, it starts the conversation. And people start to part of pay attention. Or, mm, maybe I should take my foot off the gas pedal and go a few miles per hour slower. So that's definitely the first thing we should do. The next thing we should try to do is maybe see if we could do some type of wildlife crossing, some type of structure that will aid the organism going from side A of the road to side B of the road. Um, the definition of a wildlife crossing is something that is intended to connect once contiguous habitat uh, that's now fragmented, typically by a road, but it could be by anything. Uh, in reality, these are one type of wildlife corridor. Is, is Brenton, have you guys talked about wildlife corridors yet? Yeah. Okay. So wildlife corridor, a, 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 a higher than average, or higher than random concentration of animal movements in this area. So you guys were just mentioning earlier about riparian corridors, stuff like that, totally. Uh, those would be considered wildlife corridor. Essentially, we're trying to create a small, a mini wildlife corridor to get critters from one side of a road to another. The notion first began in Europe because Europe has so many railroad and, and road beds uh, that it's, it's just Swiss cheesed up the yin yang. So they were the first ones that, that came to embrace this notion of creating wildlife crossings. But it has since spread across the globe, and people do this all around the planet now. And in general, these things are, are one of two things. They're either an overpass, a thing covering the road, or an underpass, a thing going underneath the roadbed. Here's, here, this is a cartoon example. This is not real. This is a Photoshop version. So, so this part here was real, and then this rest is just Photoshopped in. But this, is sort of, this would be the ultimate. This would be super awesome, right, if we could do something like this. So what you see is you have your roads so people can do the transportation and the commerce and things they need to do. But there's all of these points, ubiquitous, uh, where we have, we have uh, trees and, and contiguous vegetation and all this and that so that it's relatively easy for the organism to get from one from from this region to this region without being killed on the road right so that's the ideal 
Here's what they did in Florida. They, they, they took advantage of some things, and one of the easiest things to take advantage of are hydrological realities. So we have to move water. We can't have water flowing over a road in most instances. So a lot of times engineers will build uh, uh, water conveyance structures underneath the road, and that's something we could potentially use. In and of themselves, they, they might work, but usually they need some help. So this is, this is one of those things. So this is an underpass under this 46 freeway in Florida. And what we've done is we put a, a, a metal plate right here in the ground that goes to a, a camera trap, which is what the, we took the picture here. And so when something of a certain weight steps on that, that essentially trigger mechanism, it, it, the shutter triggers and it takes a picture. So um, this is, yeah, it's shutter. So back when I started using wildlife cameras, we actually had shutters. You guys don't know what those are anymore. But, so nowadays it's all electronic and just the, the, the electrons move. But back in the day there was a shutter and the shutter was triggered in this case. And so this alligator uh, was crossing. So that's cool. That, that's evidence that this um, alligator can go from side A to side B and not have to uh, necessarily get whacked by the road. Um, if we pull back, we can see another element of this. So when we have this, this, this water conveyance structure, but then we've come in and we've put fencing in there, right? So this is going to be guiding. So that if, if uh, and the idea is you want this fencing not to go 5 or 10 or 20 feet, but to go ideally a, a good way so we act as a funnel. So anywhere, you know, from over here, you know, a couple hundred meters, over there, a couple hundred meters, anywhere a critter is going and going to hit, this, hit the roadway, it would encounter the fence first and then ideally kind of angled such that if I still wanted to go this direction, I would kind of walk along the edge of the fence and then find my way to the, the crossing structure. So fencing is key. Um, so hard to get US-wide data. I've been trying to work on a paper on this for a long time, but hard to get US-wide data. But if we talk about um, the ubiquity of roads and roadkill, um, it's, it, ma it's massive. So this is, um, as of 20, 2004, there was something, an estimated 2000, or 253,000 um, accidents. Accidents significant, to report, significant enough that you call your insurance agent and say, hey, I hit a deer, I hit a bubble. I should say, also, since we're talking about it, if you ever do hit a deer or something, do not wash your car. Call the insurance agent and leave it all grody and nasty and everything. Because what people tend to do is they tend to hit something, a dog, a deer, whatever, and they come home like, oh my God, there's my headlights broken. They tend to rinse down their car. And they call the insurance agent. And the insurance agent comes out two, three days later and they go, I think you hit a tree. Like, no, 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 dude, this deer ran out in front of the road. Like, mm, yeah, I don't think so. So you need to take pictures, you need to document it with, unfortunately, the gore in place, just as a as a FYI to you youngins. Okay, so um, very widely quoted statistic, one million vertebrates killed daily in the US. And not yearly, daily. That is huge. That's a massive source of mortality. Hard to verify that. There's some sort of, when you start looking at these estimates, it, the math starts to get really kind of, well, I think it was this and I think it was that. But it, it serves to make the point that that it's on that order of magnitude, whether that number is exactly correct or not. Um, we have bears killed in protected areas. In, two th in 2004, uh, as of 2004, we had, and then now they keep it private, so I can't look it up anymore, but um, 25,000 roadkill bingos, right? So this is when you're driving on in the car. I know everybody's on their cell phones now, and nobody's talking to each other in the long, road, long drives. But back in the day, but we had phones, we had to talk to each other or listen to your parents' music, which sucked in the, in the car, right? Or usually sucked. Um, and so this is, one of the, this is one of the things that was sold to keep kids busy, right? So you guys have all done probably, you know, license plate bingo or driving like, okay, it's fine, uh, whatever, license plate from Arizona or something like that. So this is a game. And the idea here is not, not spot the rabbit or the squirrel, but spot the roadkill rabbit or the roadkill squirrel. And so the fact that if this was just sort of a novelty thing, they would have sold, you know, a couple hundred, a few thousand. But the fact they sold, they're selling tens of thousands of these things suggests that there's enough roadkill to actually be useful as a game, right? Um, and then all these other numbers. But, but uh, uh, one of the most important ones here is this is for us in California. We had a 93% reduction in desert tortoise mortality. Desert tortoise, super slow. So out in the Mojave Desert out here, 
in Southern California, um, huge problem with these guys getting whacked by cars because they would slowly move out in the road and they couldn't quickly get out of the way. And so uh, Senator Feinstein authored some legislation that amongst other things, uh, provided some money to fence this one highest, highest uh, kill area. So we put up fences. That one 15 mile fence reduced desert tortoise roadkill by 93%, suggesting again that these roads are major sources of mortality. Okay, here's another, est here's another uh, uh, estimate as to what roads can do. So this is of a beetle. This is a beetle about the size of your fingernail. This is in Germany. So we picked up, these guys picked up these beetles and they put nail polish on them. They put nail polish on their back and they, and they wrote a number on them so we could track them. So they picked them up, painted them, marked them, and then put them back down. And so what we're seeing here is a, is a visualization of their data. And then they went back and, and they looked to see where they could find them again. So they recaptured them. So here we go. So this is, this is the road. This is the main road, the big freeway, the Autobahn, if you will. I don't remember what it was, but it was a big freeway. And then this is a turnaround. So this is a sort of gravelly dirt turnaround. So people that, that wanted to go the other direction on the road could do that. Okay. So this is paved with lots of cars. This is unpaved with an occasional car. And so what you see is the dot is where they picked the individual up. And then where they found the individual again is shown with the, shown with the connecting line. And when that, uh, when that, when that relationship was little, it's visualized with this black dot. When it's getting a little, little more common, that's sort of this dot with a bullet, uh, bullseye in the middle. And then where there's, where it happened a lot, um, there was the, is the dark, uh, uh, the critters were detected a lot there. There's the solid dot. So what's the pattern you see? Right. So even for little teeny tiny bugs, roads are a real barrier and not just road roads, not just the big, um, you know, major roads, but even these little, little small gravelly type things, um, critters rarely seem to cross those. So roads are not just a problem for the big, you know, sexy, charismatic megafauna. They're a problem for just about everything that's associated with the terrestrial world. Okay, so this is some uh, traffic camera video from my colleague Josip Kusak in um, Croatia. And this is on a, a freeway in a nighttime video in um, Croatia. And let's see what happens. So what you're seeing to the right there is a mama bear. She has some cubs. Mama bear crawls over the barrier, the fence. Starts walking across the roadbed. Be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. Oh, there's another bear in the middle. Oh, got to go over that. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Uh, go over. Uh, boom. Okay, oh, another one. Got to go over that one. Uh, go over. Look out for the trucks. Wait, where's my cubs? Where's my cubs? Oh, snap. I got to get my cubs. Oh, snap. Don't get killed. What? Onk. Uh, look out for the truck. Oh, look, see, it's not all negative, right? Sometimes they say survive. You guys thought she was going to die or something? Right, so, so, um, right? That's what these guys have to deal with. So it made you get stressed out? Sorry. 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 Everybody breathe, breathe, breathe. See, I, I'm, it's not all doom and gloom. I can show a positive thing. But, um, uh, so, so these roads are real barriers. And even though we erect sometimes, you know, really strong um, fencing, if there isn't a, a nearby crossing, the critters, the, if they need to cross in that area, they will attempt to cross in that area. So, so again, real problems. Even for this moder very modern highway with, with modern technology to try to exclude animals from the roadbed. Um, another example from closer to home about fragmentation. So this is our, these are, uh, California tiger salamanders. Is anybody doing California tiger salamanders for their species? No? Okay. Anyway, uh, they used to be abundant. Now there are not very many of them. Uh, so these are interesting critters. Um, check out, here's their habitat. This, this, is, this is where they used to be. This is a little zoom in on, on this area here. This is where they are now. They used to be everywhere. But now we have all this intensive agriculture. So in this case, not necessarily roads, although roads are a part of it. And highly densified urban cores where they, they can't live. 
we had a problem of this with this um, up at Stanford. One of the things I had to work on was trying to get these tiger salamanders safe. And so one of the things we did, even though these tiger salamanders are about the size of your, your hand, so they're relatively small, they're amphibians. This is a roadbed on the University of Stanford uh, campus. And essentially there's a big hill up here where they spend most of their lives and they hang out in, in uh, grasslands and oak woodlands. And then over here to the left, you can't see there's a big giant seasonal wetland and that's where they go to breed. They're amphibians. So they have to have standing water to lay their eggs or they can't reproduce. And essentially the right time of the year comes. It's very specific. It's a nighttime thing. Has to be nighttime. Has to be slightly drizzling uh, or really, really heavy fog. There has to be some kind of moon out. And, and it's all these things. They have to have like, you know, Barry White playing and all this kind of stuff. It's very specific cues. And then they'll come down the hill. But they won't, if, if you make just a, a typical dark tunnel, they won't go into the dark tunnel. So they're scared of the dark. So um, this is wildlife crossings that we built. And so the idea is they come down here, hit this. You, you can see it a bit on the other side, but this is a version of a wildlife, of a road fence. So the idea is here, if a, and so that they come down here, reproduce, when they're done reproducing, they go back and or when they're babies and they hatch, they go back up and they need to cross back up into their, their, their main resident area. And so they're getting squished on the road. So we originally started paying undergrads like you guys to go walk the roads. Uh, at the right time of the it's it fall is when this happens. So, you know, fall around Halloween time, walk the roads. And, and one, you know, Stanford undergrads like to be paid a lot. But then more importantly, every once in a while, somebody's like, oh, I'm really tired. I want to get up. And, and so it wasn't perfect. They would walk the roads. When we would find a, a salamander over here, we'd scoop them up, weigh them, measure them, scoop them up, and then take them over the other side, let them go. More typically, we'd find dead guys. We'd scoop them up to save them to do population analysis, genetic analysis. And then, uh, and if we found a wounded one, very rarely, every once in a while, we found a wo wounded one that it, say it had his tail smushed, we would take him back to the lab and try to recoup him and, and recover him. It basically never worked, but did that. That wasn't really working, so this was the next plan. So we tried some experiments with um, uh, roadkill. Um, this is essentially a, a road crossing structure. In this case, the crossing structure are these very expensive from Europe tunnels, which didn't work. But that's another story. Um, and so they're very expensive. They have holes cut in the, into the top to allow in starlight or moonlight. Again, those guys won't go, into the, won't go into a purely dark tunnel. So it has to be at least vaguely illuminated. Um, and so, but that was an attempt to do a crossing for an amphibian. Um, again, all kinds of isolated patches like we have here in Southern California could benefit from having more connections across these roadbeds. Um, even birds are, are whacked. Here are some images from road crossing structures in um, Europe, which again has, has historically been the leader in this technology, in this, in this conservation tool. So in this case, here is the main road bay way right up here. We've actually visually obscured the cars. So some critters, even if we have an underpass, the fact that there's a whoosh, 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 that'll spook them away. So in this case, we have this fence so that at least you still hear the vehicles, but, but visually you don't have that cue that there's something dangerous there. Then here is, this is just like we saw before with the Florida example, an underpass. Here we have, you know, essentially concrete pillars, but we've shaded it, right? So we've put in these trees so it doesn't look like it's a big artificial thing. So it looks a little more inviting, a little more natural for critters to, to be enticed to go underneath there. Uh, here's an example again of a, of a, um, of a potentially problematic uh, crossing. So you might look at this and go, oh, hey, here's the roadbed. Here's where the critters can go. Um, and so maybe that's fine under low water conditions. But I'll just tell you, a lot of this is deep. And so if you're something like, I don't know what, say a bobcat or something small, Maybe it's so deep you can't, you can't get by. Turns out right here on this side, they put in a little ledge. So right here, there's a ledge that's only about you know, a few inches or a foot or so deep so that the critters can walk along that. But it's, it's not perfect, right? It, it's hard. And so just simply putting a crossing structure doesn't necessarily achieve, it's better than nothing, definitely, but it's not gonna necessarily achieve the benefit for the organisms we want if it's not attuned or potentially uh, use, usable by them. 
Here's a so-called a flyover overpass. So this is an area, and this one, I like this one a lot. So this was a cool one. This is in Slovenia, and bears were getting killed here. So the road originally came from up here on the right. It went down on the, on the hill here, and then it, here was the old road. Then it went over and it went up. And the villagers, this wasn't, this wasn't some UN law or some international accord or something. The villagers were getting really upset that bears were dying. One, it was a safety thing, but also they just didn't like their bears getting killed. So they petitioned the government to do something about it. And so the response was, hey, in this particular place, the, the, the ground itself is a, is a really good, you know, really, there's lots of forest here on this side and behind us, really good uh, uh, crossing site. Let's, let's maybe, in this case, instead of building something over under, let's move the road itself. So that's what they built. They built this bridge over this little valley and dramatically reduce the bear mortality um, with it. So, so essentially lifting the road to create a crossing structure as opposed to digging below or building over on top. Here's one in Switzerland I like a lot. Uh, here's where we left the roadbed in place and we essentially dumped a bunch of dirt, filled in this area and created this overpass. And again, this can be an example of a potentially win-win. Got to be careful that when you hear people say that, but potentially win-win. So here, uh, not only can can uh, animals cross the cross over this roadbed, but also people can, right? So hikers can have access to, say, the the parkland on the other side or or whatever without having to walk a long distance. Here we have fencing. It's not as far as I'd like. I'd like to see this fencing go extend a lot further, but but you can see stuff like that. Then here's an example uh, in, from Germany where uh, they really try to take this notion of multiple use uh, to, to um, you know, they re really uh, support that notion. And so here, the roadbed, or the, uh, the roadway is lowered, so they dug a little tunnel, and here they have a really extensive um, uh, overpass where animals can cross. Again, it's fenced so people would stay away. And there's all kinds of stuff that happens here, and it's so popular, it's a stop for tourist tour buses now. So it's not just an initial crossing, it's a place for interpretation. And if you look to the side, what you see is you actually have uh, beehive, uh, uh, apiary folks putting beehives over here. So it's actually trying to, it's serving to bring additional um, vegetation communities, other things, and it, it has lots of benefits. So it has benefits for all kinds of um, critters and people. And this is probably the most famous one you guys will read about. This is the Banff uh, National Park crossing and so they have three of these you can't see them all you only see two here but here's this here's this one and this is essentially what we're trying to use as a model for our liberty canyon crossing here in the santa monica's that we're in the process of trying to design so that we can have mountain lions and other critters get from uh, essentially escape or, or get into the santa monica mountains so let's look at some of their crossings. This is the, these are the ones they get all this press for, but they've done all kinds of crossings. So for example, here we see these overpasses. Here's a riparian underpass. Here's an underpass. But then they have different types of passes, and they've been actually monitoring these actively. So some of these guys are more curvy tunnels. Some of these are more boxy tunnels. Some of them are, have gates, et cetera. And this is, this is where they're located in, on the border of British Columbia and Alberta. But check it out. Overpass is visualized with the clear bars, underpass with the gray bars. So what kind of so what kind of wildlife crossing should we build? And I should say this is this is proportion of all the kills. This is proportion of all the kills observed for that species, and then this is the total number of, of deaths. Or excuse me, excuse me, sorry, 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 no, this is not deaths. This is a total number of crossings that happen. This is and then this is in a proportional sense, and this is the uh, total number of crossings that were observed. And if you can't see it, this is grizzly bear, these bars, this is black bear, these bars, this is uh, wolf, these bars, and this is mountain lion on these bars. So what kind of crossing structure should we build? Yes, the answer is it depends on the species. So check it out, grizzly bears really like to go on the overpass. They, they pretty much don't like to go in tunnels. They're scared of the dog. Right? Um, uh, wolves tend to like to do the overpass. They will sometimes go on the underpass. Black bears don't care. Black bears don't care. Black bears go over, under, whoop, whoop. Mountain lions seem to prefer the underpass. 
on average? So the answer is it's going to depend on what critters we're most concerned about. And if we don't know, as with most things in conservation biology, the answer is be heterogeneous. If we don't know, a little bit of both. So if we're going to build two, I, I would probably build you know, one over, one under, assuming, assuming that was logistically feasible, right? OK. So, so different critters will respond to crossings differently. Okay, let's look at our last example, which is, the, which is Croatia, what they've done in Croatia. Now, um, you guys are probably too young to remember this, but um, when President Clinton was in office, we had this crazy war. Go so th this, was, this was the 90s. We had the Soviet Union collapse, and we had a lot of the, the former, former countries that were members of the Soviet Union started to uh, disintegrate and cause, cause problems. So one of the things we saw, we saw a lot of... Um, the, the, the former Yugoslavia broke up into all these different um, uh, sub areas and there was this big war, Serbians, everybody was killing it. So, so as a long story short, this, man, this translated in, to all kinds of death and destruction and horrible, 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 horrible war stuff going on. Pretty much the worst war we've seen since Europe, I mean, I mean, I mean since World War II until the, the modern Syrian-Iraq debacle that's going on now. So uh, a lot of the roads were damaged. So late 90s, we emerged from this horrible war period, and these guys have to essentially rebuild their country. So as where you and I have all these roads, and when we want to build a wildlife crossing, we're talking now, we're talking the order of $10, you know, $10 million, $12 million to build this, this one crossing structure at Liberty Canyon we're trying to build. One, one structure, right? It's best to, as with everything, installing solar panels on your roof, whatever, it's really expensive when you come back in after the fact and have to build it. If you can build that action in, that, that structure in, as you're building the rest of the house, the rest of the road, the rest of the rail track, it's, it's relatively cheap, right? You already have the labor, you already have the permissions, you just gotta do a few more drivings of bulldozers, right? And so that's, that's the opportunity that Croatia had. So they were rebuilt. They essentially destroyed all their road network. So they had to rebuild all their roadways. But now they could rebuild them with the best technology. They knew what it worked, what didn't work. And that includes also for concerns related to wildlife crossings. And check it out. It's a, very, it's, it's a, simi it's a grossly similar habitat to us in California. It's Mediterranean, has a lot of coastal mountains. It's not just a flat plain. Um, and so a lot of interesting parallels. So in the 1960s, yeah, so, so these guys started uh, building, started thinking about crossings in the 1960s, but didn't really make much progress until the late 2000s. So this is my friend, Josip Kusak. So he's our main tracker. And this, I just gave him a bunch of fox poop and said, is this fox poop? And he said, yeah, this is fox poop. I said, thanks, dude. And so uh, these slides are all from him, courtesy of him. If you guys are interested, uh, I had him to campus a couple years ago, and he gave a couple great talks. He gave a talk to conservation biology, your class right here, and also gave a departmental seminar. Those are up on iTunes U. We'll be putting those on our regular ESRM zone at some point in the near future. But for now, if you guys go to iTunes U and you search ESRM, and you go to Cons Bio, you could watch his seminars, which are great. I would encourage you guys to check those out. Um, again, extensive forests in Croatia. Um, and so here's what these guys did. So here, here, here are these, here's this road. These black dots are crossing structures. That's amazing. That's totally crazy. On this one chunk of, um, chunk of highway, we have 44 crossings, which when you add up the width is 25% of the length of the, of the freeway, of the highway. That is awesome. That means ample opportunity. Does, does, that, does that mean critters still die on the road? Yes, they still die on the road. But much, much less than if they had, um, if we'd not had those structures, right? It's baked into it. They, they use the term green bridge a lot of times when they build an overpass. So they, they build these so-called green bridges. Here's another roadbed. Again, same thing. The road is in red. The crossing structures are in black. And here, 10% of the road is, in, uh, 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 is, is able to be crossed by critters. Um, same thing here. 
So uh, in this case, here the the red circles are all of tat. So they they tag uh, wolves and bears here, and so these are tracks of. I think these are wolves. I think if I remember correctly, so these are wolf tracks, right? So here there's wolves on both sides of the road, um, and so they're they're able to get across. So if you look at his if you look at his uh, online lectures, he talks about how there was extreme disconnect. These guys weren't crossing the road. There was a lot of death before they put these guys in. Now we have um, a lot of opportunity to cross. This is how they built them. Again, they went in, and so as they were building the roads, they baked the crossing structures into the road. So this is a road they were putting in, and normally they would just build the road. But here they're actually adding this, this tunnel-type structure. Then they fill it in with dirt and rocks and continue to fill it in. And it, you know, it looks like that. So we have meters thick of soil. So you can have big tree, you know, relatively big trees. It's not some shallow little grass. It's you can have you know solid vegetation. They they actively plant it with trees to get the to get the woody vegetation you know jump started. And um, it pretty. This is one that I visited when I was on my sabbatical there. Um, it, it grows back really well. They also monitor stuff, or at least they initially monitored stuff. And so here is um, looking at the, at the entrance. This is essentially the start of one of these bridges. So here we have wildlife cameras pointing this way and this way, and we have counters. This is this is just uh, organism counter. And then we have this area where you can where you can uh, 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 rake it clear and actually look at the tracks. So we got some fantastic data from the first little bit, and then it turns out, let's see, do I have a, yeah. So here, so here are these sand, so-called sand traps. We can actually, you know, look more in depth at um, animal tracks and who's crossing. There's some bear tracks, for example. These are from the cameras. These are all guys that are using. So we have bear, we have deer, we have foxes. We have this coyote that just ate something. What the hell did he eat? I don't know what he ate. He ate something tasty. Right, so that's awesome, right? So these guys are, 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 using, are doing the ecological things they do normally, but they're, they're doing it on this area. Um, so the one downside is, is this, is that we've, in some cases, and this is the thing we have to be careful of in Liberty Canyon, we've created a pinch point. So for the first little bit, we're getting all this great data. Oh, great data, awesome, you know, all this and that. Then, what started showing, I don't have the picture here, but then what started showing up in the camera traps? Hunters with rifles. So they understood. The word got out that all these animals funnel through this little area and they all come right by here. Hey, want to figure out where the, bird, where the bears are? We can go, you know, spend a couple days tracking them down the forest or we could wait right here where they're all going to walk by. So then the hunters started breaking our camera traps. As <laughs> We have the same problem in Louisiana. People are like, oh, I don't want to be seen, right? So, so there's other challenges that come along after that, but, uh, but in general, these things can work for crossing, for, for connectivity. And here's, and here's one, this is a fantastic one, look at all that, those trees and everything. But for example, um, we get lots of de deer using the uh, different, uh, deer using the structures, we get lynx, we get wolves, everybody seems to use them. There's one of our wolves collared, and these guys move all around. And here's evidence that these radio collaring, in this case of wolves, crossing, right? So here's this track, this guy's over here doing do 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 do, then he, then he crosses here, goes over here do do do, then he crosses here. Here's a, here's a, here's a try to cross here, didn't. Notice there's no bridge, right? There's no, there's no crossing structure. It went up, came back, um, and et cetera. Okay, finish up with just the, the last few examples from California. Obviously, the last few examples from the U.S. So um, what has Florida done to deal with issues of wildlife crossing? So uh, uh, perhaps the best example is this alligator alley example, the I-75. Um, essentially, they uh, installed all these things we're talking about, underpasses, crossing structures, more than 40 miles of fencing. And they saw a massive reduction, what we would call a mountain lion, what they call Florida panther. There's arguments as to whether they're, they're a true different subspecies. But the point is... Uh, very few mountain lions remain in Florida, and they saw a reduction of, of, of those guys' deaths, bears, etc. Colorado, short grass prairie, getting fragmented by building roads, by building highways especially. And so a fantastic example where um, uh, partnerships were created. So the Colorado Department of Transportation, along with their state wildlife agency, agencies, and federal agencies and the Nature Conservancy got together and they said, hey, instead of you proposing a road 
and then we, us coming and suing you and saying, don't do that, whatever. Why don't we work together to create a long-term plan and figure out where are the roads likely to go over the next several decades? And then we can talk about mitigating the downsides early and, and, and right now. Um, and we'll take care of that. And so a really great program where, where the Nature Conservancy buys land and works to restore habitat so it acts as attractant so critters don't necessarily need to cross the road. And they do that before they put the roads in. At least they try to do it before they put the roads in. So a wonderful approach to not thinking about problem, respond to the problem, but let's get in front of the problem. Here's uh, what we've done in California, the so-called Tri-Agency Partnership. These are all state agencies, the state EPA, state resource, state resource agency, which is the home for, um, we used to call fish and game, now we call fish and wildlife. Um, and then the, the authority that, that funds uh, construction of roads and stuff. And again, the same idea here is don't do this project by project by project. Let's see if we can come together, say where are the potential problem areas, get those mapped out and understand those and flag those first ahead of time. Not propose a road and then go hire a bunch of biologists to figure out there's a problem around it, but actually have that, in this case, mapping out wetlands and proposing um, if we did have an impact here, how could, where could the crossing structure go ahead of time? So that radically improves um, the outcome reduces the cost, all that kind of stuff, reduces delays. Here's an example from Zion National Park in Utah. And here, uh, has anybody been to Zion? Okay, a couple people, cool. Right, so, um, so in this, when, did you, when did you guys go? In the summertime, in the wintertime? Okay, so very early summer, okay. It really gets jumping in the summertime. Has anybody been there in the summertime? And it's super packed with people, right? Yeah, gazillion million people. So here's here's the problem. In this case, um, to over we you know the whole issue of loving our parks to death. So the the issue here is there in the in the central it's a sort of canyon type setting. So the central part of the park, the visitor center, all that kind of stuff is it's kind of like Yosemite. It's on the valley floor, and everybody's concentrated in the valley floor. So in the middle of summer, right when school's out, it's 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 you it's you you know it's it's bumper to bumper traffic locked up it takes forever to go to wherever you're trying to go it just sucks and so what these guys have started they started um, this notion of uh, more public transportation so they have these buses so these buses are compressed natural gas i think they may, maybe even tried some electric ones now but the idea is start these buses and get get people's cars outside the valley floor as much as we can and, and have these frequent buses going all the time so it's easy to get to whatever the attraction you're trying to get to is a location without needing your car. Encouraging biking, all that kind of stuff. So that has all kinds of really great, and it's free I should also say, you don't have to pay for it. So that has all kinds of great things. We have less potential road kill encounters, but also improve uh, air quality, less noise, all that kind of stuff. So again, one of those issues where we have a lot of benefits. And the last example I'll show you here is the most sophisticated one. Um, this one still, as far as I can tell, hasn't been fully ro rolled out. Um, but I call these guys every couple years to check, and last time I checked, it hasn't been fully ro rolled out, but it, it's been tested. So here's the idea. The idea is when we talk about some areas, like up in uh, uh, Idaho and places where we have these you know, large animals up near Yellowstone, et cetera, large animals walking on the road, we're talking rural U.S., so long distances between, between areas, right? So people tend to drive relatively fast. And at times of years, we, time of year, we get some significant fog or a, a, you know, hard to see uh, far distances, right? And so what was going on is we have these people hitting bison and things, right? So obviously you hit a, you hit a squirrel and that sucks for the squirrel, right? You hit a bison, that sucks for you too, right? So this is a, a real risk. And these are areas where people routinely drive, you know, 70 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour. So so it's bad enough hitting a bison at 25 miles an hour or something, but you know, imagine hitting it at, at those speeds. It's, it's calamitous for everyone. And because, because the, the areas are so remote, when you do have an accident, it takes a long time for EMS to get to you, so the probability of folks dying is much, much greater. Okay, so the question is, what do we do? We've, we've, we've tried the road signs. We've tried the, we've tried the, hey, watch out for wildlife crossing. Doesn't, I mean, you know, works a little bit, but it hasn't solved the problem. So most people are still used to doing what they're doing. Again, relatively infrequently do people encounter a bison. So again, they get used to driving fast and it just becomes a thing and they're trying to go to work or whatever. 
So the idea here was, let's put sensors up on the side of the roads. Here's what one of them looks like. Uh, they have, uh, and we've now tried this, we're starting to try this in some place in California too, in Northern California, where we have particular issues with uh, deer, abundant deer crossing. But so basically we have a solar powered station, so it's autonomous, it's not, not hooked into any grid, so you don't need to be in some, some uh, you know, power line supplied area. Um, we, uh, and it has a sensor. So we have a sensor, choo, 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 choo. So um, these guys were trying microwaves because they're trying to shoot it over larger distances, but you can in theory use different things. Essentially animal trigger. So the idea is we're trying to hit large things, not little rabbits, not little squirrels where it'd be going off every, you know, every few minutes, but only things that would potentially be lethal to the driver. Um, uh, so large body critters. So the idea is as this critter would be, or this elk or whatever it would be about to cross the road, this guy, would, this guy would trigger, and this sucker would start to flash, this hazard light. Pock, 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 stop, or slow down, not stop, but you know, reduce speed, reduce speed, reduce speed. And um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty cool. So the idea is these warnings are there, but they only activate when there's a real risk. So therefore, you have people not getting acclimated to the sign, and, and really do, when they see that sign flash, they're much more likely to slow down and therefore avoid an accident with, you know, with them getting hurt and an accident with the animal getting hurt. So they've had some challenges with false triggers. And or, you know, so, so, so getting the sensitivity is totally right. You can imagine that. And you can imagine that if so this is the, the demo, right? Everything's super mode. You can imagine once the grass starts to grow up and starts to kind of you know, blow in front of the sensor. So there's lots of logistic challenges, but something like this might be Great. And now what people are talking about is, is tie this into, say, an app on your phone. Don't touch your phone in the car, but you could have it rigged in somehow, right? So that you can imagine that if there was a, a hazard, it would trigger a warning to anybody in the area that maybe had that, that application on on their phone or who knows, maybe even in the car. And it would, you know, warning, 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 there's a large object approaching. So something like that is probably going to become more ubiquitous in the years that come. But but it's currently a challenge right now with our with the funding systems to, to fund these. But so that, that's a so-called road, roadway animal detection system. Um, these things are always going on. We always have these issues and they're, they're, they're not going away. So to summarize what we just talked about, so wildlife crossings, if, we, if you guys want to build a wildlife crossing, you're thinking about that. We first want to figure out how animals move around the landscape, right? Do they even need, are they even being impacted by this? So that includes both studying their movements, but also doing road surveys like you guys are, gonna, are about to start doing. Um, we can do retrofitting of existing roadways. It's best to do it as we first build the road. So when we're doing an expansion or a widening, use that opportunity to also put in a road, uh, a crossing. For example, it'll be much, much, much cheaper. Um, the other thing, as I said, that TNC and some folks have done is actually buy the land on both sides of the, of the, prop, of the uh, crossing so that we can control stuff. One, one issue we've had a problem with in Moore Park on the 23 where we've been trying to deal with some stuff, uh, pr private property owners own the land right up to the edge of the, uh, right up to the edge of the freeway. So it's really, really hard to put a, it's been hard to find places where we can put crossings because the animals are crossing where the animals want to cross, but they might be on private land. And so for us, putting up, you know, uh, uh, guide fencing and stuff like that is, is problematic. And sometimes the homeowners are, yeah, cool. Other times they're like, no way, dude, this is my property. So owning the land on either side or having it in public, publicly held or a nonprofit, that can greatly improve um, the success of, of the road crossing structure. Once we do put it in, put it in, we need to, as with all our conservation stuff, we need to monitor the efficacy. So the the salamander tunnels I put didn't work. That sucks, but at least we know they didn't work. When I bought those tunnels, oh they work great. Oh yeah, this group up in Davis did them. Da -da, all these people did them. That was baloney. They didn't work. They didn't work for those. For they haven't worked for anybody. So that technology was a good try, right? I'm not faulting the people for trying it, but. We need to not be put, wasting our money on those. Those three, those three tunnels underneath the, underneath that that road bed I put in, three hundred thousand dollars for that. So you can imagine all the cool stuff we could have done with that three hundred thousand dollars that on something that would have been more successful, right? So we want to monitor, and and I don't want to waste money, but the most important thing is to not waste money again, right? So that's the key thing. And then in general, the easiest thing to do is is add more signage. 
And uh, we didn't mention this, but another thing you can do related to add signage that is relatively cheap is reduce the speed limit. That can be challenging, but, but that is something that doesn't necessarily require a gazillion billion dollars. Ultimately, the answer is have fewer vehicle trips on those roadbeds, and that, that will dramatically reduce the accidents with people and the mortality for wildlife. Cool? Questions about any of that stuff?